in uh, block 15, um, we have uh, Remco, uh, Rachel and Francis. Um, Rachel and Francis uh, work for the British Library. Remco works for the National Archives of the Netherlands. Um, and their talk will be about how to get heritage organizations to start using PITS, a tale of two countries. So over to you. Hello, everyone. Um, just sorting the screen sharing out. Um, Rachel's kindly sharing the screen. Um, but just by way of introduction, um, my name is uh, Frances Madden. I'm based at the British Library and I'm joined here by um, Rachel uh, Katarski and Remco van Veenendaal from the Dutch National Archives. And um, as Helena said, we're going to be talking about um, getting heritage organizations to use persistent identifiers. Um, so could I have the next slide, please? Um, so the two countries, the UK and the Netherlands, have um, both have uh, projects around persistent identifiers in cultural heritage, um, but the projects are at different stages. So today we're going to be talking about um, what the um, UK project can learn from the Dutch project, which has been running for longer. And then we want to find out as well what we can learn from you, um, all of you who are um, attending. So um, with that, I'll um, turn off my camera and I'll hand over to Rachel. Lovely, thank you very much, Francis. There we go, you can see me, fantastic. Um, I can no longer see my slides, there we go. Um, yes, so the project in the UK to look at the use of uh, heritage organisations, uh, use of persistent identifiers is called PIDS as IRO infrastructure. Um, so just to clarify, hopefully you all know what the PIDS bit means, but the IRO stands for uh, Independent Research Organisation. So these are organisations who are able to obtain funding from uh, the UK's national funder, UKRI, UK Research Innovation, um, but we are not actually formally um, higher education institutions, we're not affiliated with uh, any universities, we are independent research organisations. So the Arts and Humanities Research Council in the UK have a programme called Towards a National Collection. This funding programme is about dissolving the barriers between heritage collections across the UK. And when we saw this call come out, uh, our first thought at the British Library was persistent identifiers. That's a way to link information held in various uh, silos with stable persistent links. Uh, let's put in a project uh, uh, looking at persistent identifiers to, to do that, essentially. Um, we were successful and our project started uh, in February 2020. Uh, a great time to be start starting any project, I'm sure you'll agree. Um, the aim of our project is to investigate how we can increase the uptake and use of persistent identifiers for heritage collections across the UK. Um, and so, yes, I'm going to tell you a little bit of what we found so far, but also pose a few questions to Remco to find out how we can continue to push this work forward uh, and learn from what they've done in the Netherlands already. So the work that we have managed to do uh, in the first year, despite everything that's gone on, is uh, starting off with a survey. So what we really wanted to understand is what is the current state of play of awareness and use of persistent identifiers uh, in UK cultural heritage. So we ran that from May to September. Um, because of all the difficulties we've had across the sector with museums, libraries, galleries, all being closed to the public, Lots of staff across the sector in the UK have been furloughed um, for much of the last year. We kind of left that survey as op open for as long as possible. So we did have it uh, open quite a few months. Um, but also this is just a baseline survey. So we want to know that all the work that we do do in the remainder of the project, what is the impact of that uh, in increasing awareness and use of persistent identifiers in the sector? We're also performing case studies. So the other partners uh, was in the project. So you'll have seen on the previous slide that we're also working with uh, National Gallery, Royal Botanic Gardens, Edinburgh, b &A Science Museum, University of Glasgow, NHM. We will be doing case studies across all of those organisations. We've completed two uh, large scale case studies, one for the British Library, one for the National Gallery with more to follow. Um, there is a link at the bottom to early findings there. Uh, hopefully someone will be able to paste it into the chat so you can actually click on that link and have a look. I think it was really interesting for us to see the results of the survey. 
our assumption before starting it was because we don't see a lot of um, persistent identifiers as in those that are um, globally unique and resolvable and managed for persistence attached to the collections of UK cultural heritage, we thought maybe they don't really know what they are. But actually, when we did the survey, we found out there was a much higher awareness of persistent identifiers than we thought. Uh, apologies to the size. We'll share the slides later so that you can see them a bit bigger. Um, but essentially, we can see here is just over 60 percent um, either were aware of and used some persistent identifiers or they regularly use persistent identifiers. So that was actually um, not what we were expecting as a result of this survey. We also found that most organisations that responded, so we invited um, organisational responses, not just responses of individual colleagues, um, that actually more organisations than we thought said they were using them. Um, and I guess the other finding is, which is, was less of a surprise, is that well-established, relatively generic persistent identifiers, so things like uh, DOIs and ORCIDs were well known and the, the newer emerging persistent identifier types were less well known, so that was less of a shock. I think we are still trying to work through what the biases in this data could be. Obviously, people who are very interested in persistent identifiers are more likely to respond, although we did do a lot of work trying to encourage people to respond and say, even if you don't have no idea what we're talking about, please respond to the survey because that's still useful information to us, but we don't really know how successful that was. So based on the survey, the case studies that we've done so far and a few workshops that we've held, uh, obviously we've been forced to hold those virtually, but um, that was actually a blessing more than a curse because we got a lot more feedback than we would have done otherwise. Um, these are our early findings and recommendations. I think lots of these will be familiar to some of the talks that we've already had um, throughout the first half of Pitapalooza. It's about articulating the value proposition to decision makers, uh, understanding the requirements, so do cultural heritage organisations have slightly different requirements to the traditional kind of publishing environment um, where most of the persistent identifiers that we're familiar with have come from? Um, working with system suppliers to make sure that the uh, collection management systems they use can actually support persistent identifiers. Understanding what the costs uh, of implementation are, um, as well as management. Um, enhancing citation practices for heritage artefacts. So, as a library, one of the biggest things we find is that people like to cite the physical object, even though they've only ever seen the digital object. So uh, understanding how to change that behavior, um, as well as looking at sector wide governance. So we shouldn't be doing this all as individuals. There should be uh, sector wide approaches. So this is what we found so far. Um, but, you know, we still have uh, 10 months of the project to go and there are a lot of questions we're still working through. So our questions to Remco, as someone who is much further ahead in this work than us, are what are the core requirements that he's found that are core to uh, cultural heritage organisations? How do you actually work out the cost of implementation and management of PIDs? Um, that is not easy with quite diverse organisations within the sector. What works when we do explain uh, persistent identifiers to decision makers uh, to get them to work with us? And what other next steps? would you recommend? And this is where I hand over to Remco to help answer some of those questions. And that's exactly what I'll try to do, answer some of the questions. I don't have all the questions, um, but a bit of context perhaps first. Um, as you can see from the photo up there, um, I prefer live links, not dead ones. And I actually met a live link at uh, the Swiss Toy Fern in, uh, Fair, Fair in Bern a couple of years ago. Um, which was a good thing. Um, but then uh, zooming in on um, the actual answers, uh, a bit of context first. I work um, as a digital preservation officer at the National Archives of the Netherlands. Um, and I'm also involved as a project manager for persistent identifiers in the Dutch Digital Heritage Network. So we have an actual uh, national approach to, um, to sustainable uh, visible and usable digital heritage in the Netherlands. And persistent identifiers is one of the uh, focus areas in the sustainable area of this uh, national program. And I'm currently a uh, project leader for that. And from that perspective, I will try to give some answers. Uh, and I'm only zooming in on the answers, not on all the other things that we've done in the project. 
So could you show the next slide, please? Great, yeah. So what struck me is that we have a kind of similar approach as what uh, Rachel and Francis are doing. Uh, but yeah, we just happened to start in uh, uh, six years ago, 2015. So we also started to inventorize and uh, do awareness raising at cultural heritage organizations. So uh, in order to get them aware of the problem of not having persistent identifiers and uh, to get commitment from uh, their management. To actually get commitment, it was a good thing to have in place some organizational and especially financial models and um, some, uh, some funds available for the actual implementation of persistent identifiers in their systems. So from these action areas, um, we got some um, requirements for the solutions that we were going to, uh, to propose. One of the things is that these organizations needed help deciding which type of persistent identifier to use. And one of the things that we created, which is kind of like a voting compass for uh, elections, but now for persistent identifiers, is a PID guide, which you can find on uh, pitweiser.nl. Um, and it's it's similar, but a web application, um, a web application form to what uh, the project Freya did with their uh, PID decision trees that you can find on Zenodo. Another requirement is that any solution had to be low on technical requirements because especially the smaller cultural heritage organizations would not be able themselves to implement and maintain and uh, all these pits by themselves and leave it to their system administrators or application managers. And of course, they wanted it to be as cheap as possible. And in fact, these three um, bullets will also help you discuss uh, implementation of persistent identifiers with uh, management of organizations because, yeah, they want it to be uh, easy. Uh, low in budget and they want you uh, to tell them uh, or at least to help them um, get underway. So we, we created rather a lot of documentation um, to guide them and to, uh, to help them start on their implementation projects. Could you go to the next slide, please? Marvelous. So now to answer the question what it will cost to actually implement persistent identifiers in these cultural heritage organizations. Well, in order to answer that question um, in these five years, we sat down with um, uh, five leading suppliers of collection management systems in the Netherlands. And we didn't actually talk to them directly, uh, but we involved their user groups so that their users would actually request persistent identifiers in those systems. And we also talked to a leading PIT service providers in the Netherlands, which in our case, uh, we focused on Euro and NBN, Handle and DOI. So we talked to uh, the KB, National Library, uh, Surf Sara, and also to uh, Delft Technical University. And um, in combination, um, we noticed that uh, for the basic PIT services provided by KB, Surf Sara, TU Delft, uh, you could obtain persistent ident identifiers for uh, below a thousand euros per year. This is probably known to most of you in the audience, but this was not something that we knew up front uh, for all cultural heritage organizations. Then we noticed that the main cost for implementation of persistent identifiers was in actually getting them, uh, getting these suppliers to, um, to host persistent identifiers in their collection management systems. And for an average of uh, 15,000 euros uh, we noticed that they were able to implement a place a placeholder or location for persistent identifiers in their systems and of course um, for that money we asked them to create a reusable solution that other customers could use as well and we asked them to document what they did in best practice documentation and you can find all that on uh, pitweiser.nl uh, slash en for the English version. We also documented this in a paper 
that we presented at IPRESS and that you can find online as well. So then the um, uh, simple calculation for persistent identifiers is uh, a one-time uh, starting fee plus a yearly fee for the basic costs of the PIT service provider uh, plus some fee uh, for um, uh, the supplier. And usually, um, and this, these are rough figures, um, uh, these cultural heritage organizations can also get persistent identifiers in their systems for around uh, 2,000 euros per year, two and a half thousand euros per year. Uh, but there is a great variation in the actual cost. Could you go to the next slide, please? So in the next phase of our project, uh, where, we are, where we currently are, uh, we are focusing on what it will cost to actually maintain PIDs in your systems. And we are doing an investigation uh, by um, having uh, calls with uh, cultural heritage organizations. Um, we're also, uh, again, trying to uh, talk to the pit suppliers uh, because we want to know um, what does it cost to maintain, publish, use uh, persistent identifiers in the organizations. And of course, we also want to ask them what their users are doing with these persistent identifiers. So our assumption is that these users will just say, well, what the beep is this thing that I find on your website? And that some call a deep link, others call a persistent link, or persistent ID, or what have you kind of names. Uh, what do I do with it? How do we tell them that they should bookmark that? They should use uh, the persistent identifier, et cetera, rather than the, the URL that they always find in the top of their web browser. So that's what we're currently investigating. And another thing we did last year, just to tell you, is that as a project, this uh, project will end soon. Uh, so we decided, uh, as Dutch National uh, Heritage uh, Network, that all the results of all our projects should find their way to uh, also a sustainable location within the network. And we as National uh, Archives, we decided to uh, start hosting or taking over the hosting of uh, all the PIT information, PIT services. And uh, just in case you want to know, for roughly 5,000 euros per year, um, we know that we can do the hosting, uh, the tech support, uh, content management of pitvisor.nl and also do some community management as well and host workshops and, and answer questions and all that. So could you go to the next slide, please? Now, to answer the question, what would I recommend as next steps to Rachel and Francis is first to make sure that these cultural heritage organizations you're talking to are mature enough to start using persistent identifiers. Uh, I came across examples of, of, of cultural heritage organizations who were just publishing spreadsheets on their website. Um, and that's not a good basis for starting to talk about PIDs. Even though they were interested, they were not there yet to actually start using persistent identifiers. So make, make sure you know these organizations are ready to actually use persistent identifiers. Those that are ready, um, I think should, you should start to uh, discuss um, a pit, with pit service providers and uh, these uh, suppliers of systems to see if you can also, uh, let's say, cut in the middleman, the system uh, uh, vendor, um, to, well, to, to make sure that the cultural heritage organizations all can make use of persistent identifiers in these collection management systems and on their websites rather than all having to do this by themselves. So that should be my recommendation to Francis and Rachel from the experiences from the last five, six years that we had. Um, but of course, um, this is also a great opportunity to ask the audience what your recommendations would be. Uh, perhaps you can answer some of the questions that are on the next slide. Yes, so we're really keen to get some um, feedback on our questions and um, 
comments as well. Um, if anyone has any questions too, I think that would be really useful. Um, but I suppose it takes a little while to type. Um, so I don't know if Rachel has any comments on what Remco just said. Yes, I do. Um, I'll, I'll not squidge myself in so that people can see the questions, but you can still hear me. Um, and I think that I was going to comment that actually understanding when organisations are mature enough and ready enough to use persistent identifiers is definitely a known issue for us in the UK. So we have an issue where some very small scale cultural heritage organisations who still have you know, significant uh, collections, the only way they're currently able to share digital versions of their content is just by popping them up on their websites in a CMS. So they don't even, you know, have a proper collection management system or at least not a digital one. So actually integrating persistent identifiers for them becomes doubly difficult um, because there's not a, a platform they can simply integrate them into. Um, so that's definitely one issue we have to look into. I think one of my other questions was we talked about the cost of implementation and management. How do we then calculate uh, the benefits or the return on investment that we have for that process as well? Uh, we've had a question about um, requirements for uh, PIDs and metadata for heritage collections. Um, I think one thing it's fair to say is that we don't really have a schema that um, is specifically designed for, for cultural heritage. So at, at this point beyond um, cataloging systems, um, I don't know, Remco, if you've come, if you had any experience with that in the Netherlands? Uh, no, we didn't. We didn't actually uh, ask them to do anything like that uh, and, and come up with schemas and, and all that because we really wanted to focus on uh, getting them to use persistent identifiers uh, any which way possible. Um, so, yeah, we didn't have any requirements for that. Yeah, okay. Um, so I also noted in the chat, we had a comment um, from Alex who works for, or is involved with the uh, DISCO infrastructure. And um, we've had some discussions um, with, Di with DISCO um, as part of the case study group that's in preparation around the Natural History Museum. So someone else was, as well was asking about um, collaboration with the Natural History Museum. So we're working closely with them as well. Um, and Alex has just mentioned that um, the, sch the schema is new, there needs to be a new schema for heritage collections um, because you can have difficulties, I think, with consistency across the different, yeah. um, the different types of objects. Okay. So I think we're, coming up on time soon. Is that right, Helena? Uh, yes, that's right. We would like to give people a couple minutes to move between um, blocks and tracks. Uh, so yeah, feel free to take maybe one other question uh, or I don't know, have some closing words and then after that we'll close this session. Remco and Rachel, is there anything you'd like to, to close with? I was just going to say, if anyone does have an answer to my question of how we uh, do a calculation of the benefits um, to do the kind of return on investment piece around implementing PIDs, um, it would be great to hear any examples that you have. So we'll be on the Slack or we'll keep an eye on there for any uh, answers to any of our questions, as well as any follow up questions that people might have for us as well. Yes. And, and for me, um, I would really like to hear from the audience if this approach of, let's say, cutting in the middleman and, and the route via the, the vendors uh, is something uh, you would prefer to, or if you have any other suggestions for uh, approaches in the future. Okay, then, well, thanks a lot, Remco, Francis, and Rachel for this really interesting session. Uh, as I said at the start, you can continue the conversation uh, in the Pitapalooza Slack, there is a Q&A um, channel there that you can use to have further discussion and ask the speakers more questions and, of course, to answer their questions. So thanks, everyone, um, for 